I just want to give a few seconds for everyone to check in. It kind of takes maybe about 20 seconds or so for people to start clicking in. It's noon, so that means it's time to start. However, let's just go ahead and get things going. And uh, just hold on for just a second for the people to check in. Say, oh, am I plugged into the right thing? All right, I think we're good. So let's get this show on the road, folks. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, Tech Out fans. Welcome to yet another episode of Tech Art Talk Live. Well, today we're going to be going over what I thought would have been an easy topic. I said, well, easy, you know, so I'm going that it wouldn't take me long to prepare. Huh. Boy, was that a big mistake. Well, I may have to step on this time. I wanted to create, okay, let's talk about the tools of the trade. What tools, what programs, what computer accessories does a tech artist need to get involved with if they want to get involved with the industry? I said, yeah, no problem. This will be easy. Huh. <laughs> Ah, so, all right, surfers, strap down your leashes, wax up your boards, and get ready to go on to an adventure, because we are about to go into the tools of the trade uh, for tech artists. And I've got to warn you that uh, this is a little bit overwhelming, but needless to say, hang in there, it could be good. Uh-oh. Got rid of that. Random phone call. Anyway, so... Let's start off with the big things first. Come on, let's go to the big things. You can do it. There it is. It come to daddy. All right, great. Now let's talk about operating systems. You know, that's the whole computer. And pretty much, you know, it's, I'm going to be biased. I try to be unbiased through this whole episode and try to keep things neutral. But I'm going to have to put my foot down here. If you guys aren't using Unix, you guys aren't using Linux, you guys aren't using real computer graphics. And if you're operating from Windows, you know, clicky clicky foo foo with the buttons there, if you're stuck there, okay, if you are aware of what I'm going to talk about next, the command line, okay, if you know what it is, start using it. That's where all the power of the universe lies in itty bitty living space. Okay, so but if you don't know what I'm talking about, no worries. In a few years, I promise you, uh, you tech artists, you'll probably figure it out and you'll get going with that. So with that said, I love Unix, I love Linux, and this should be the operating system that everyone is working. But in reality, everyone pretty much works with Windows. You know, that's kind of like the way things are. You know, you don't have to love it. It's just what everyone is. You know, that's what everyone works at. It's what's most common. And that's what you're going to find most of the time. Now, you will find some of the places they do use uh, Apple and uh, Apple OS. And sometimes, not always, um, I'm not going to make a uh, decisive say of which is better, a PC or a Mac, but in general, you'll find more PCs out into the industry than you will find Macs. But that doesn't say that you're not going to find Macs. And it doesn't mean you're not going to find Linux either. It's just that you might have to look a little bit harder. All right. Now, now the programming languages are loosely associated with that. And I'm going to come right out and say that uh, if you want to learn a computer language, go if you have the time, if you have the resources, go ahead and learn C++. C++, in my opinion, is the Latin of computer languages. If you understand C++, you can handle anything. And that will prepare you for just about whatever you could possibly need. And so C++ is pretty much the way to go. And if you don't have the time, but C++ will take time, and you can't just read a book on C++ and learn C++. You've got to spend the time. You've got to spend the effort. you got to work at it real hard. Now, a couple of other possible la languages you might want to worry about are HLSL, GLSL, and VAX. Okay, these are basic uh, shading languages. Now, these are pretty much specific to shading languages. However, in uh, the new UE4 version, they're going to be exposing expressions and within the expressions you can type in custom hsl so hsl is now basically being used as a an expression language which is actually pretty cool because it's pretty powerful and it's not as powerful as c plus plus but it's not too shabby now below that is what i call the basic entry light if you want to be a tech artist you've got to learn python everyone and their uncle uses python i mean just about everything has a python uh, interface to it 
you name it, it's got a Python interface. Now Python has gone through a few changes. Well, they, they, they've been holding on to 2.7 forever, but this year we're finally 20, I guess 2020 uh, with this whole COVID-19 thing has slowed things down. But needless to say, everyone's been dragging their feet, making the transition from Python 2.7 to Python 3.7. Okay, 2020, 2021, these are gonna be the years where everyone move, makes the move over to Python 3.7. So learn Python, it's a great object-oriented, it's real simple to pick up, it's real easy to use, it's a, it's a good language, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's good object-orientedness, and you can get as basically as crazy as you want. There's a lot of good support for it. So Python is basically a good, ultimately, Labrador retriever of your good uh, programming language, and it's a great place to start. Now, some of you are going, oh, I say, oh, I don't need to learn Python because I know Mel, or I know MaxScript. And uh, yeah, there are those folks out there saying, yeah, I know HScript. Uh, uh, yeah, sorry, not good enough. Sorry, not only are those languages very, very device specific, you know, program specific, but they really aren't very robust enough to handle uh, what you really need to know. Uh, and I'm sorry that they're just really, they, they, they're, they're just not robust and dynamic enough to handle the needs of basic production. All right, now let's go on to the big beast here. These are the DCCs. Now, in case you didn't know, DCC stands for um, Digital Content Creation Software. Okay, so that's what it stands for. And we're gonna be looking at the 2D, the 3D, yeah, we're gonna be looking at animation software, and we're gonna be looking at rendering, and I'm gonna render, and we're gonna look at offline renderers, 2D compositing, and uh, real-time or otherwise game, uh, real-time rendering or game engines. Okay, let's look at the 2D. Now, in 2D, Photoshop is pretty much the big beast. This is the 800-pound gorilla that most people use. However, it's kind of expensive, so a lot of people don't want to use that. And if you really want to go high-end, you know, you get to some people, especially like in the film world, they're going to use a package called Mari. Because Mari really gets end up really high quality, really finesse, uh, really high-end digital painting. But for everyone else, a lot of folks like the, uh, the shareware version of something like GIMP. Or they might use something like Krita. You know, don't want to face, but these are actually really good, powerful tools, so don't uh, dismiss them. And for those of you who actually have succumbed and gone into the dark side and do things in the command line, use Image Magic. It is way cool and it is way powerful. I love it. It's kind of like the old uh, days of uh, massive image management. Cool stuff. All right. Oh, yeah, there's also ACDC that you might be able to find out there. And some folks use it, and it's a pretty much available shareware, and I think it's uh, pretty easily used. Okay, let's look at 2.5D. Now, I saw call it 2.5D because ultimately what you're doing is you're producing texture maps, uh, but you're doing it kind of like in a procedural way. And so the best example is that substance. Now, PBR is kind of like the where things are at. Uh, everything is going, PBR is a really, really good rendering standard, and you don't really want to dismiss it, but you kind of have to know what you're doing. And Substance, substance Designer, Substance Painter, provides a really good way for you to pr produce all of the necessary text maps you need in order to create really beautiful PBR images. Now, also, and it's, this is, has, okay, what substance you have to pay for, Quixel, yeah, you know, it's part of that whole UE4 license business. And you can access Quixel for free, you know, with, under the same licensing conditions as UE4. And it's pretty cool. It's not quite as dynamic as, uh, um, as Substance, but it's still pretty cool. I just took a lesson with the uh, Quixel gang over at UE4, and it's a pretty decent, ca uh, pretty good, decent package, and it should give you some great... Uh, physically based textures that you use. And so don't dismiss that. I, in fact, I think I'm going to try to work in Quixel and teach it to my uh, graduates this fall. All right, 3D. Now this is kind of like, this is, a, this, is the, this is the real beast here. Okay, I hate to say it to everybody, but Blender is on its way. Blender is coming. Blender is uh, shareware, and it, you don't have to pay for it. You can get into it for free. And you've got packages that you have to pay for and now they're starting to copy features that are in blender and they're it's a, so blender is starting to get to the path where they're leading the path so you know you're probably saying like well i thought all i needed to learn was Maya, and that's all i ever had to learn 
Well, no. I, in my humble opinion, I think Blender is going to be on its way, and Blender is going to be conquering the industry very, very soon. So, but on that thing, what does it have to compete with? Well, you name it, Maya. Now, everyone and their uncle knows Maya. Not because Maya is a great software, it's just because Maya and Autodesk did a really, really good job about like 10 years ago getting into schools and teaching Maya to everyone. And now everyone and their uncle knows Maya. And for most students who have gotten into 3D and they want to say, all I know is Maya and they don't know anything else. But other than Maya, what else is there? There's 3D Studio Max, which is also a really good package that a lot of companies uh, really favor. And sometimes they're, they're use a package called Inventor, and you see that around a little bit. Uh, maybe that come, comes up with something a little bit later. But I'll tell you. Mudbox is a 3D sculpting software that they, uh, that they use. It's all part of the suite. If you're looking at the logos, you're starting to see a trend here. And Revit is you know, very, very popular with the architecture community. It wasn't so uh, big a few years ago, but uh, some of the packages are really starting to support Revit, and it's starting to become really popular. And Fusion 360 is kind of like this is what Inventor has kind of become. And Fusion 360 is a really good package. It's kind of like um, Autodesk's version of uh, Houdini a little bit, uh, where it's kind of like a procedural based, uh, where you uh, look at your, uh, your history based uh, modeling. And you, it's really good for creating hard surfaces, really good package. And the commonality amongst all these last six um, DCCs is that they're all created by what is known as Autodesk. And so I'm going to lump all those into Autodesk while I finish the rest of this list. Ha, ha, ha. Okay, and of course Houdini. You know, I, of course, you know me, I love Houdini. I teach the Houdini Live uh, at 3 o'clock on this channel, and I'm always going to push Houdini. But, you know, Houdini has uh, always been there, and they're kind of like my family, and there's always a, it's like a warm place in my heart for Houdini. But uh, it's not the end all for everything, so it has, definitely has its place and its uh, purpose for everything. But I'm going to keep pushing it as hard as I can. Uh, ZBrush is a is kind of like the sculpting package of choice now. Uh, that's kind of like where everyone and their uncle is going to want to do any kind of three dimensional digital sculpting. Rhino is also a up and coming player into the game. It's really starting to get uh, prominence within the industry. Moto now Moto has been pretty much dedicated pretty much to the film world, but in, uh, as the game world is going into its next generation and we're getting into the next version of like UE5 and so forth, you're going to start to see people want that high quality modeling and then suddenly things won't be so different between the film world and the game world anymore and you're going to start to see people using Moto more. All right, SketchUp has been kind of like an architectural uh, modeling tool for people to kind of jump in and just start playing around and start creating some uh, real good solid geometries, real good environments and so forth. And SketchUp um, is freeware and people can use it. So SketchUp has always been around and SketchUp will probably have a warm place in the hearts for a lot of people for a very long time. Okay, 3D Coat is a way of uh, kind of like sculpting, creating texture UVs, and it's a little bit like ZBrush, and it's a little bit like Substance, and kind of like a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and 3D Coat uh, is good, but the uh, artists still love using it, uh, especially for creating and painting textures. Okay, AutoCAD. Okay, now this is what uh, Autodesk really makes all of its money on. Now, does this actually play into the computer graphics world? A little bit. Uh, you're going to go through your career and you probably will see it eventually sooner or later. It's just because you're going to end up with environments, you're going to end up with props, you're going to end up with design elements that have been created in AutoCAD and they're going to want to see it inside of the game, they're going to want to see it inside of the film. What are you going to do? You're going to figure out how to get that AutoCAD stuff into your game engine, how to get it into your render, how to get it into Maya, how to get it into Blender. And this is something that you're going to need to uh, be aware of. Uh, okay, we've got uh, Katia and this is uh, Dassault Systems, and uh, this is a French company that worked pretty much with uh, architectural and visualization. I don't really know too much about them, but evidently as far as in the simulation and in the architectural world, they're pretty big, so these are definitely an up-and-coming player. Okay, we've got inside of the film world, you've got uh, Cinema 4D, which is a real prominent uh, uh, player in there, so you're going to see a lot of that, and you're going to start to see that moving over into the uh, game world and more into the simulation. And there is also City Builder, which is pretty much dedicated for, you guessed it, building cities. Now, uh, 
it offers a way of creating procedural cities, and it's a good package and so forth, but you do have to pay for it. And so it's a niche package that not everyone in their own cohort is going to have an opportunity to play with, but it still is something to really to play with, and it, and it will be part of pretty much every team's pipeline sooner or later. Okay, now I kind of got a special category in here for 3D VR, because this is kind of like 3D modeling, but it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like, well, it's, it's kind of its own beast. And the most popular of that is, um, is the, uh, the Google Tilt Brush. You know, came, this came out with the, uh, the Vive, you know, about four years back, and it kind of set the standard. And it's a lot of fun and curates some really cool stuff. And so other players that are dealing with the same thing in 3D sculpting are things like uh, Quill from Facebook and Medium from uh, Oculus. Now, these are all really good packages, and some artists are really starting to focus in on modeling in virtual reality, and they're starting to create some really good material. So I wanted to include this slide along the way. Okay, animation software. Okay, now, yep, you guessed it. Maya is pretty much where you're going to be at it. If the company doesn't create its own animation, custom proprietary software, they're most probably going to be using Maya. And if they're not using Maya, then they're going to be using Motion Builder. Now, about eight years ago, Autodesk said, hey, get it, we're gonna not continue with Motion Builder anymore. And here it is eight years later, and Motion Builder's still going strong. So, you know, Autodesk, are you gonna cancel, discontinue uh, Motion Builder or not? You know, who knows? But Motion Builder is a really great package. A lot of artists uh, really love working with mocap data inside Motion Builder, and it's a, a good overall animation package, and uh, animators really love it. Okay, 3D Studio Max, once again, part of that whole uh, Autodesk uh, evil empire that uh, is all over. But they produce really good stuff, and you can see a lot of animations produced in uh, 3D Studio Max. Okay, good old Houdini. Whenever you need any kind of procedural animation, yeah, Houdini's pretty much going to do it. Now, this is both, uh, it used to be standard, like, only in the film world, but it's gotten to be so in the game world. If you want any kind of procedural motion, any kind of motion that you want to kind of push out and have a procedural generator or process, you're going to be putting it through Houdini. Okay, and now, this is kind of a specialty. This is called Marvelous, Marvelous Designer. Marvelous Designer is a little bit like Houdini, and it's, it's a simulation package. And what it does is you import a model, and you import some clothing, and what Marvelous does is, depending on the clothing type, it deforms and animates the clothing in order to conform to the body that's underneath it. And so if you have some really complicated clothing animation that you want to deal with, then you're probably going to be using something like Marvelous Designer in order to create the simulation. It's a really good package, but it is niche, so um, it, it definitely is being used like in the film world, and I know they used it for the game world, or they used it for Madden in order to deform our jer jerseys, but uh, you'll start to see it around here and there, and it's a really good package. Okay. Now let's get into the renderers because this is where things start separating and, it's going to be, and this is where things are going to start to blur in the next few years, I think. Okay, RenderMan started it all. I am proud to say that I still have my issue number one, a first edition of RenderMan. And so that was uh, from almost 30 years ago. But this is uh, still kind of the standard and they kind of set the whole thing in motion. Now, Arnold has been kind of a, a standard in the offline rendering that kind of competed with RenderMan. It was, uh, I think it was uh, released with Autodesk and so forth, and a lot of people chose uh, Arnold, and Arnold is still a real strong workhorse inside of the film world these days. Okay, now you have a new player called Redshift. You know, Redshift takes advantage of the GPU in order to help accelerate its uh, process, so you'll see, start to see a lot more Redshift coming along. And now we have V-Ray. Now V-Ray is kind of like a, an independent uh, early uh, path tracing and photon rendering or photon mapping algorithm. So it's a good one. So you see that uh, if the, you're in Maya or Max and uh, you don't want to use uh, Arnold and you're not too keen on RenderMan, then you might be using V-Ray. Okay, um, Octane is an early attempt at some real-time ray tracing. And uh, the, the real-time ray tracing has been the holy grail, kind of like in computer graphics for the last 30 years. <laughs> uh, and they were one of the first people to actually start uh, getting some really positive results. Okay, guess what? Blender, uh -huh -huh. okay, they've got a package called Cycles. Now, a rendering package, now they produce some pretty good physically-based rendering looking quality stuff with Cycles, and uh, there's 
their rendering package is now pretty much comparable with the likes of Arnold, Renship, and RenderMan. Okay, Marmoset is really popular, especially with uh, the artists in providing truth and kind of uh, kind of like positive, like you know, reference images for the model. Because they end up, you know, computing and just create this beautiful sculpt and this beautiful model. They might polish it off in, in Marmoset. Marmoset's got a great uh, uh, plug-in that they can put onto websites and allow you to look at all the uh, layers inside of the model consecutively. And so Marmoset is a really popular package, especially amongst all of the modelers in the industry. All right, and uh, Mental Ray. Uh, Mental Ray, it's kind of like you're not going to see it around too much anymore. But back in the day, back in the 90s, they were the first real company to actually start using ray tracing. And that was a really long strong, and it used to be a standard inside Maya. Uh, if you were going to render in Maya, you used to render it always in Mental Ray. But I think it was uh, bought out by NVIDIA uh, a handful of years ago, and I think it's been discontinued since. But so I wanted to at least mention it because you might actually see Mental Ray popping up here and there. Okay, Keyshot is another place that uh, artists like to get into, especially if they want to start dealing with ray tracing uh, for their. Uh, for their models and so forth, and Keyshot provides a really easy interface for artists to load in their models and start creating some really fantastic ray trace PBR materials for their models, and they use it for proofing. Okay, now if you're going to create render stuff offline, then you're going to need to probably do some 2D compositing, and the big the big bad boy is Nuke. I mean, Nuke pretty much invented uh, nonlinear editing. I mean. You know, it started off as a language, then uh, Phil Spitzak and gang created a whole uh, node-based rendering language, and they kind of set the standard for almost everything. So Nuke is kind of like where it's at. And I haven't worked with Nuke in, God, it must be about 20 years, but man, I still have a warm spot in my heart for Nuke, and Nuke is really the uh, compositing packet of choice. Now, a lot of folks use After Effects. After Effects it provides a lower entry point than Nuke does, and it, a lot of folks have gotten some really good results with After Effects and start using it. Now. Some folks might actually use, like on the freer side, they go to Blackmagic Fusion. Now, if you can find a, a copy of Blackmagic Fusion around, it is still a really good package. Maybe not as powerful as uh, After Effects and Nuke, but still a really solid workhorse. And there's here's a package that, I, if I do any more compositing, I might actually go there. This is a shareware version. This is called Natron. Natron is a shareware version of uh, a compositing package that you know, looks like it's producing some really good, uh, really good results. It has had some rocky history of whether it's going to continue on, but it's a shareware package and it is still alive and kicking, so you might want to look into Natron. All right, now let's look at the real-time rendering or the game engines. Okay, now this is pretty much, I'm not going to get political here, this is pretty much dominated by two players, the UE4 and the Unity crowd. I'm not, like I said, I'm not going to discuss you know, which one is better. I think each one is outstanding. They each have their own benefits. They each have their own cons. And uh, pretty much the industry is run by these two guys. So most of you, okay, if you're not using a proprietary renderer, which you probably will, once you start working in the industry, and if you're working in games or simulation, most of your big companies have their own engine. And they don't be they're using Unity or UE4. But if they do, you know, then you'll be aware of it. And they're great, these are great, awesome learning packages. All right, a few years ago, there was this third player in the uh, game engine world called Crytek, and it was a good package. But I think they bumped into some financial difficulties, so Amazon bumped in and said, hey, let's get into this game, because you know this whole real-time rendering thing is a big deal, and the whole industry is going in this direction. But they bought it, and they turned it into a package called Lumberyard. Now, I don't know how much you know people are using it right now, but it is still available and people are still using it. So uh, you might want to look at uh, Lumberyard and Crytek. You know, these are a, a real good rendering package because remember, Crytek was right on the heels of UE4 and Unity up until a couple of years ago. Okay, there it is again, Blender. See, I was talking about. Okay, they've got a rendering engine called Eevee, which is pretty good real-time rendering. Now they do all of their uh, real-time development using this, and it is pretty darn snazzy. You know, imagine having a renderer that's uh, about the quality of UE4 or Unity, but have it in with your modeling in your rendering pack or your animation package. 
a little bit unsight unheard of. Now, I don't know if anyone's actually building any games off of Blender. You know, maybe you can tell me, inform me a little bit of it. But this is definitely a trend of things to come. Hint, hint, hint. Okay, now for those of you who says, okay, enough of this 3D stuff. We want to tell stories. We want to have uh, visual novels. Well, then RenPy, or RenP, is the, uh, RenPy is the package of software that you know, creating any kind of role-playing game, any kind of like JRPG, or any kind of like novel-based or kind of um, painting-based uh, story that's kind of script-driven, or if you're really into the writing and the story aspect of it, then RenPy is definitely the place to go. And uh, RenPy is still used, especially in academia and in the more well, let's just say the sober game markets than uh, all of the whiz bang and so forth. All right, now we got that under control. Let's talk about revision control. Now, a lot of you folks who want to get into tech art may not go know what revision control is. Now, revision control basically is simple. Once you work on something, you say, "Okay, this is great. Save it. Okay, we don't want to lose it. Okay, you save it, and then what? And then someone says, "Make a backup of it in case you lose it." Okay, they make a backup of it, and suddenly you have the two files laying around. If you keep doing that, then you're going to end up with a folder, like what we used to do back in the 80s and the 90s, where you have the backups, and you literally have 100 versions of the same thing. Okay, reversion control software prevents you from having to do that. Okay, you has a server, and then once you come up to a, uh, a certain point, you like where it is, you say, okay, I'm going to push this to the server, and suddenly the server takes care of your revision, and it remembers it for you and it can store unlimited number of versions, and it's really great for working on teams. And if you haven't started working with revision control, get into the habit, because once you have start using it, then you realize it's an absolutely indispensable tool. And if you're a tech artist, you will be living in your revision control service. Whoops, okay. Now the big player in this is Perforce, or they go by Helix and so forth, but Perforce is really what the most people know. This is kind of like the big dog. A lot of people play this, but you know, like all things, it is, you do have to pay for it, and it is kind of expensive. So, uh, well, so a lot of people choose it if they can. Uh, uh, it is a, a really good software, it, and it has its pros and it has its cons, but, you know, this is pretty much a, a you know, a, a decent standby if you can afford it. Now, if you can't afford it, SVN, or Subversion, is also a really, really great package. And uh, I used to work with Subversion, I used Subversion on many, many projects, and while not as clean to work with, and the interface is not as easy to work with as, in my opinion, as uh, Perforce, it still gets the job done and it still does really well. And if you're gonna continue on with the shareware and so forth, then by all means, use Git. Now, Git is really starting to gain momentum, and it is starting to go all over the place, and especially like if you're a developer or a programmer, then you're probably using Git already. And in fact, the company that makes uh, Perforce or the Helix, they have a, a Git integration in Ford. So Git is, in my humble opinion, out of the revision control softwares, its philosophy is the hardest to understand, especially when it comes to integrating and going off and creating branches and so forth. It's, that's what it's geared for. But you really got to have a good understanding of it in really order to take advantage of it. So if you're going to use Git, you know, spend a little bit of extra time in understanding how it thinks and behaves because then it'll really start to pay off. Okay, now there's a new player on the game. Now, I don't know if they're going to stick around or not, but they're called Plastic. Now, Plastic is totally geared you know, towards artists. So if it's geared towards artists, and you see a lot of companies you know, starting to get this because they want their artists using the revision control, and which in the tradition in the past, artists have been kind of reluctant in uh, dealing with. So plastic is a compromise. So get into using plastic, and if your company is willing to pay for it, it seems like it's a really good package, and I've only heard good things about it. Okay. Now, this is an area that I honestly know very little about other than the things that I've used, but uh, these are kind of essential when you're working with a larger team of maybe more than about three to five people, and this is a production management tool. Now, go and talk with your producer, go and talk with your uh, project manager to get a good download on how this behaves. Jira is free. It's created by Atlassian. You know, for small teams, it's, uh, it's, it's available for usage and so forth. If you want to pay for the plugins, you want to pay for the support, you can do that and so forth. But this seems like a good overall package. Now, if you really want to get into things, okay, Autodesk got into the, uh, um, into the thing and they created, and they bought a company called Shotgun. Now, I myself have got a chance to work with Shotgun a couple times and I really like it. 
it is really geared for artistic uh, feedback. It's really good for uh, kind of like a waterfall uh, allegation or cascade management to showing how the progress and the stages of asset development. I really like Shotgun. But once again, this is a paid for product and not necessarily going to be found everywhere because they may not have the funds in order to uh, justify it. Okay. Instead of Jira, Atlassian also has this other thing called Confluence. Now, in my humble opinion, Confluence doesn't work out so good as a project management software, but people still use it. And, uh, they, you know, they can, they can get good works with it. And, uh, you know, a lot of people really like the Atl Atlassian products, so it's either Jira or Confluence. All right. Now really, you can use almost anything for good project management, and I've been to locations where we use Bugzilla for project management. It's a little bit quirky, a little bit funky, we say, hey, you know, I'm not an uh, IT department, you know, I'm a tech artist, we deal with assets, we create assets, and we work it up. Okay, this does a pretty good job of keeping track of what needs to be done, which assets need to be done in which order, and what products, and if they have any issues, you know, a good way of keeping track with it. So even something like Bugzilla is something very manageable. All right, now I've been rattling my tongue for the last, gosh, about a half hour now. And you might be going, man, this is a lot. This is like, these tech artists are crazy. You mean like as a tech artist, I gotta understand all of that? And I'm going, eh, possibly. And you'll be going, oh, what have I gotten into? You know, I'm getting overwhelmed here. Don't worry, you know, I, it's all cool. You know, take on the perspective, take it easy. You are a learning sponge, you are a tech artist. That means that you absorb all this stuff. Now, a lot of these programs, once you, get to, once you understand them at a basic level, then you realize that they're all the same. And the only difference is, is the buttons or the dials. And the really, that once you understand things at the core level, then there really is no difference between all these softwares. And then so, believe it or not, your company is gonna ask you, all right, Bob, can you learn this new software over the weekend? And you're gonna go, I can do that. Now, you're gonna come back Monday morning, you're not gonna know everything, but you're gonna have a pretty good idea on how it works and how it thinks. And you're gonna go say, okay, we can pick this up on the fly, but at least it's good enough to get the, go get the ball rolling. And so that's really what you want, is just to keep going, learn things enough, to get the ball rolling. Of course, when you're working with a standard, you're going to want to know those packages that your company is using as good as you can because it's really a matter of time, and time is really what this game business or this film business is all about. Can you get that done faster? Can you create more iterations? Learn your softwares. Learn them as fast as you can, but don't worry that you don't know everything. All right, great. So that pretty much wraps up what I wanted to cover today. Please subscribe to my channel if you like what you saw. You know, you can find my channel on YouTube and look under Chris Rota. Now, check me out on LinkedIn page. I am located on Chris Rota and for Tech Art EDU. And check me out on Facebook where I'm located by, once again, Chris Rota and Tech Art Talk Live. Okay, please, if you have anything that you want to discuss, if you have anything that you want me to cover as far as it relates to Tech Art, no problem. Please send it over. If I can't, if I don't know the answer, I can find it. So please send it over. I love a challenge. Bring what you can, and I would love to see any kind of ideas that you folks want to see. So thank you very much for joining me. I look forward to talking with you again next week for another episode of Tech Art Talk Live. Have a great weekend. Bye.